for that and Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Why don't we get started? Good morning. I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. And on behalf of the World Resources Institute, the UN Environment Program, and the Wilson Center, it's a terrific privilege to welcome you all here for the, to mark the release of Restoring Nature's Capital, a new report from WRI, and a very important and tangible follow-up to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, my name is Jeff DeBelco. I direct the Environmental Change and Security Program here. And, on behalf of uh, President Director Lee Hamilton, the president of the Wilson Center, it's a real thrill uh, to be hosting uh, the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program, Achim Steiner, as well as Jonathan Lash from World Resources Institute. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it, it's a thrill for us because it is exactly this kind of discussion that we're trying to facilitate at the Wilson Center. As some of you may know, the Wilson Center was founded in 1968 by Congress as a nonpartisan, non-advocacy forum for bringing the worlds of scholarship and policy, uh, research and analysis together with the practitioners and the doers so that they could learn from one another. And I think today's discussion is a perfect example of that. We're doing that now for 13 years in the Environmental Change and Security Program where we're trying to bring the worlds of environment, development, population, and health together with foreign policy, diplomatic policy, even security policy at times. And so today's report is, is a critical input in our efforts to really um, bring great attention to ecosystem services. And it's a, a thrill for this report to be able to be launched here uh, on behalf of the Wilson Center. I'm going to keep the bio mentions very short because we're, we are short of time. You will have uh, picked up a fuller uh, set of bio sketches for each of our each of our speakers out front. But let me just say it's a real pleasure to welcome Akim Steiner, who, as I said, is executive director of UNEP. Um, you also know him as the former head of IUCN. Um, and also, I think one of his tremendous contributions was as uh, director general of the World Commission on Dams, a report that is now six or seven years old, but one that those of us working in the water area are particularly thankful for because it really made some progress putting down some norms on some critical issues um, and something that's a, a report has clearly made a difference. So um, it's terrific to have him here. Jonathan Lash, as you also know, is the president of the World Resources Institute. I think it's uh, very easy to say one of the world's most important environmental NGOs. And it's Jonathan and WRI that played a big part in the production and the di dissemination of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And so it's terrific that they are uh, WRI and Jonathan are continuing to pursue this issue in a very tangible way with, with issuing today's report, Restoring Nature's Capital. Um, and then I should also say we're, we're lucky to have uh, two of the report's primary authors, both Francis Irwin, who's a fellow at WRI, and Janet uh, Ranganathan, who is the director of WRI's People and Ecosystems Program, who will also be able to join us in the program. Uh, just a final reminder, we are webcasting today's event live, and then we'll have the the video archive. So when it comes to Q&A time, uh, we'll have a staff member come to you with a microphone so we can all hear the presentation. And also, for those of you online, um, Jonathan's PowerPoint is available on the web page, so you can pull that down and follow along as he speaks. So Akim, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Do you to come out there? Thank you very much for the invitation to be here together with uh, Jonathan and uh, all of you, a number of familiar faces in the room here also, not least some who know 10 times more than I do and have been trying to promote some of these things 10 times longer than I have, or maybe not 10 times, but Robert, I see you there and others in the room. So to some extent, I thought in a few opening remarks on the occasion of um, the publication of this Restoring Nature's Capital report that WRI has been pulling together and that follows also on many of the path-breaking, I think, uh, strands of thought and analysis that were pulled together by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. It's a good moment to pause and ask ourselves, well, where are we now in terms of bringing the concepts that the MEA articulated or the MA articulated that many of us in our different institutions have tried to incorporate in the way we communicate environment in the context of development, environment in the times of scarcity, environment in the times of climate change, environment in the times of, um, let's say, uh, almost um, an overdose of um, doomsday scenarios and to make people believe that they actually have something to gain from listening to some of the deeper messages that have been worked out 
through the processes such as the Millennium Assessment and also restoring nature's capital today. And I think the, the first thing that strikes me as very interesting is that the Millennium Assessment did not get the level of attention that the IPCC is getting right now when it talks about the future. And yet, for those of us who read that report carefully and extrapolate from it what it has actually told us is happening on the planet, what is likely to occur and what the consequences are, that is a stunning surprise. Why did the MA, which clearly was a very participatory very inclusive and also, you know, not just a scientific report. I mean, really it did try to bring <clears throat> to the international community a sense of what was happening to the world's ecosystems. Why did it not get more traction? I think in part there is, unfortunately, still a very expensive learning curve in society that goes from, you know, science emerging through communities beginning to actually look at what that science really means, verifying it empirically, translating that science then into scenarios that are real to real people and then finally being able to transcend or to break through the policy barriers that so often have great difficulty in accepting state-of-the-art science because it basically means changing the status quo. And the status quo is something that those who benefit from the status quo always benefit from and therefore have no incentive to change perspective. And I think in climate change it's very similar because how else do you explain what has been happening in the last two or three years, what has been happening just in the last three or four months? The IPCC has, you know, in a sense, published almost the same that it did a few years ago, except that the degree of certainty has gone up. Is that really enough to explain why suddenly the whole world sits up and says, whoops, what's happening? No, I think it is the gradual learning curve of a society that begins to have the courage to distance itself from the accepted wisdom to taking seriously the perhaps imperfect but nevertheless um, challenging wisdom of emerging science, of emerging findings, of emerging policy options that imply a departure from the way we do things today but where the, the necessity of doing so becomes at a certain point acceptable to society to the point that it changes the rules of the game. Unfortunately, I think in the field of ecosystems management of our understanding of how drastic an adjustment we are also looking for in this field, we are probably still five years away from perhaps that same tipping point. But I think I would have said a year or two ago, maybe 10 to 15 years away, and I now put the, the timeline on to five years because I think one of the things we have to very quickly think about is how do we link the <clears throat> almost fundamental rethinking process that climate change is now triggering in economics, in energy, in transport, in uh, sectoral planning, in agriculture, how do we actually link that also to the reality that is captured in the notion of ecosystems, that is captured in the Millennium Assessment in terms of its decline and degradation, but that is also captured in this report and many others which shows us that in fact, this is not some inevitable path, but it is a series of policy choices, it's a series of institutional adjustments, and above all, it is a series of economic reframings of decision-making processes in our society that could very easily turn us onto a path where we begin to restore natural capital rather than to continue to depreciate it. And the reason why I believe climate change has in some ways helped here is that the notion of coping with a world challenged by the, con the, the inevitable consequences, let's say, of climate change that is already programmed into our future, shows very clearly two things. One is, yes, heightened vulnerability, <clears throat> and therefore a greater risk. And I think the extreme events we were witnessing over the last just one or two years, whether it's Hurricane Katrina or you know the tornado of just a couple of days ago, yesterday I arrived in Washington and the first thing I saw, the Washington Post cover page of what the tornado did in, in Kansas. And these are all, in a sense, um, elements of raising public awareness, perhaps, of what is happening in terms of natural disasters. But they themselves don't yet produce that tipping point that we are talking about. I think the tipping point comes when we can translate the sense of vulnerability that is clearly now part of the climate change psychology that we have in our societies. People are feeling more vulnerable because they see certain phenomena that may have something to do with the vision of a future 
that is not a thousand years away, but in some cases just 20, 30, 50 years away, implying fundamental changes. So when you have that sense of vulnerability, you, and I think this is where our attention will probably have to focus in the next few years, we then have to look at how ecosystem resilience, how the capacity of well-functioning ecosystems is an integral part of the 21st century response to global warming and to climate change on the one hand, and on the other hand to the challenge of the economics of natural capital. We have spent probably the last hundred years trying to find a way around this notion that economics gave us of externalities, of things that are outside the narrow boundaries of what the true economic values are that matter. Funnily enough, it wasn't that difficult once you had climate change to begin to do that. And suddenly, you know, whether you call it energy efficiency or whether you call it um, corporate efficiency, the notion of efficiency, environment and economics have suddenly given us a nexus that you sort of sit back and think, why did it take us 100 or 150 years to translate what is an obvious intellectual recognition into a practical policy option? But that is precisely what is happening now. And that nexus, I think, will emerge also with the developments that climate change implies right now with ecosystems. And there are two or three indicators that I would like to leave you with of why I believe that is happening right now. First of all, I think capturing the value of ecosystems in both corporate or microeconomic and macroeconomic terms has become something where we have seen a tremendous development just in the last few years. And it is different from perhaps even the notion of environmental economics or ecological economics as it was brought out, let's say, 15, 20 years ago. We are not necessarily trying to invent an alternative economics framework anymore. We can even handle a lot of this in a neoclassical framework of economics. Not all of it, but certainly the ability to deal in a world as we have it today to address issues like scarcity, like sustainability, productivity of natural capital, are really not a major methodological pr problem anymore, but rather of trying to take the findings that we have and turn them into policy signals in the market. And the fascinating thing, I think, that we see at the beginning of the 21st century is that environment is beginning to shape the global markets of this world. Energy futures today are in part driven by an assessment and a risk assessment of what the CO2 footprint or exposure of that particular energy option might be. An investment in biofuels, a major emerging sector in agriculture, if you want, is in large part, when you talk to venture capitalists now, predicated on their reading of how environmental criteria, sustainability criteria, will either constrain or enable the expansion of biofuels. And all of these begin to take us back to ecosystems and the productivity of ecosystems and how ecosystems can be managed sustainably. <coughs> so the economics or the economic dimension of ecosystem management I think will be probably a frontier that is going to expand enormously over the next few years in terms of policy tools that we can apply. Secondly, I believe that the G8's decision to put the biodiversity agenda back on the Gen G8 agenda this year is indicative of a return focus perhaps on this issue that if you take biodiversity and ecosystems as a nexus has really been, well, has almost fallen off the back of the public policy agenda for the last decade. And at Heiligendamm this year, biodiversity is back, if you want, on the G8 agenda, and I think that is indicative of how governments are beginning to revisit this issue. And finally, I think we have another very interesting development, that is many empirical examples of ecosystem restoration. In a world where ecosystem degradation is taking place at such a fast pace, even if we can slow it down, the other track of investing in ecosystem restoration has gained a lot of credibility in fact, it has become a necessity, and I think it is a discipline in the field of applying ecology and biology and uh, the understanding of natural systems in the practical context of bringing back degraded landscapes that is not only politically, I think, a very important option, but also economically and practically speaking in a world of six, seven, eight, nine billion people. Without restoring some of the degraded ecosystems that we have today, we have nowhere to put these people. And if you want to have an idea, just look to Darfur and ask yourself, where would the people who are now in the refugee camps in Chad and inside Sudan return to? 
they simply cannot simply return back to their land because their land is no longer able to carry them in its current configuration, be it naturally or how it is also managed in, in terms of settlements and economic activities. So when we talk today about ecosystem management, about restoring nature's capital and the publication that is on the table here, I think we are entering into an era of perhaps a few years now of much more active rethinking of where we may actually want to put the emphasis in policy, research, and ultimately implementation terms. And for that reason alone, it's great to be here with you, Jonathan, and to be here at the Woodrow Wilson Institute to launch this publication. Thank you. So, uh, good morning. And, and Akim, I want to begin by thanking you. For those of you who don't know Akim, uh, we are incredibly lucky to have him uh, at the United Nations Environment Program at IUCN and now at UNEP. He has been an astute, eloquent, and absolutely irrepressible voice. Uh, for the environment, for understanding of ecosystems, for linking that agenda to the poor. Um, he is, above all, someone whose generous spirit makes often proceeding in large organizations through consensus processes possible where it might not be possible without him. So Akim was a major contributor to the Millennium Assessment, and, and we are trusting that his organization will be the center of gravity for it in the future. I also uh, wanted to recognize my good friend Tom Lovejoy, uh, who is sitting in the front row. Uh, Tom has been one of the leading scientific voices for understanding of ecosystems uh, since many of the people in the audience were in grade school. Um, and his organization, the Heinz Center, is now doing some of absolutely the top work uh, in the world and certainly in the United States on these issues. Tom, we're honored to have you with us. Thank you to the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center uh, for hosting us uh, today. It's a, a perfect setting. I noticed that we're, we're sandwiched between AID and EPA. Um, and actually, I think that's quite appropriate. As, as I get to the end of what I want to say, uh, it's a good place to be presenting these issues. Uh, I'd also like to recognize all of the authors uh, and, of course, uh, the sponsors for this work, uh, the Dutch Foreign Ministry, Irish Aid, and Danita. I don't know whether it's a really good sign or a little bit discouraging that it's all small North European nations who have supported this work, but they're leaders, and we thank them for their help. We uh, set out to do this piece of work based on the Millennium Assessment because the Millennium Assessment was explicitly uh, meant to be policy, policy relevant but not policy directive. Uh, the uh, MA's organizers went out of their way to try to separate the scientific findings from any controversy over what should be done about the scientific findings. So we have a compelling first physical uh, done by 1,400 of the world's best uh, doctors uh, for our Earth system, uh, but not a set of recommendations about what to do about the findings of the MA. This uh, report is based on 17 essays uh, written by a set of experts from around the world trying to pick up on the MA findings and identify a set of policy options uh, to proceed uh, to address the key issues. The report that we're launching today summarizes those findings. Uh, just quickly, the, one of the key innovations of the Millennium Assessment was not only the idea of doing a comprehensive assessment of all that we know about the condition of ecosystems, but looking at ecosystems from the point of view of their capacity to provide the goods and services and benefits on which all human well-being ultimately depends. Um, so the, the authors looked at the capacity of ecosystems to provide provisioning services like food or wood, regulating services like the protection of air quality, flood prevention, clean water, and so forth, and cultural values, those that many of us uh, enjoy. 
they found that 15 of 24 ecosystems were serious de seriously degraded in their capacity to provide for human well-being, um, and that nine were either mixed or enhanced. And for those that are enhanced, as you can see, uh, looking at aquaculture and agriculture, in many cases they're enhanced in ways that undermine uh, the capacity of, of other ecosystems. So that finding was issued in 2005 to screaming headlines and top uh, TV news coverage across the world, right? Well, no, no, not. Just imagine that Ben Bernanke went up to the, the hill today and said, we find that 15 of 24 leading economic indicators were in serious decline, and the other nine, while not yet in decline, are continuing in ways that we think is unsustainable. Well, that would be the top story uh, on every news show. Um, there would be immediate calls for action from political leaders. That's understandable, right? Um, Short-term economic indicators are much more important than long-term indicators of the capacity of the environment to support all human well-being, right? Come on. <laughs> um, I don't think so. So I want to come back to the question that Akim was raising, which is why? W why is it so difficult for us to pay attention to the information that we're getting about the systems that sustain us? And put it a little bit in perspective. So what's this? A beautiful stream that you would enjoy spending a summer afternoon next to. It also turns out that it's a highly valuable water filtration plant in the Catskills. Uh, when the Environmental Protection Agency said they were going to compel New York City to build a six to eight billion dollar water filtration plant, New York instead persuaded EPA to let them invest about a billion and a half in restoration of the Catskill watershed to protect the water supply. Not a bad service to get, saved a cool four to six billion. Or, or this one, uh, a tropical paradise. It also turns out to be the key to the continued effective operation of the Panama Canal, a 50 mile canal, which requires vast quantities of water for every ship that comes through. It turns out that the deforestation of the canal watershed uh, has both reduced the capacity of the watershed to provide a steady supply instead it comes in floods and increased sedimentation of the canal. Um, one of the results is that uh, insurers think that transit of the canal has become sufficiently uncertain that they've raised insurance rates for ships that depend on the canal for fear that they would be forced to travel instead 8,000 miles around Cape Horn, or this. Well, this was the storm protection system for the Mississippi Delta. This is the speed bump that would have slowed the storm surge from Katrina down and probably prevented much of the devastation, except for the fact that we've destroyed most of it, channelized it, uh, removed it, filled it, so it no longer provides that service. The estimates of the cost of restoring uh, that service are on the order of $14 billion, give or take $10 billion. Um, the cost of Katrina looks to be over $200 billion. So a good deal. The service was not a bad deal. In fact, people said this before Katrina. It's not that scientists didn't know that these services were valuable, we just didn't pay attention. Um, right nearby, our magnificent estuary, the Chesapeake Bay, one of the great estuary systems of the world, is under enormous stress. Front page stories in the Washington Post a, a few months ago. The decisions that have led to that stress for the Chesapeake are not accidental, they're trade-offs that we've consciously made. Most of the assault on the Chesapeake comes from the increase in nutrient runoff to the bay and the destruction of filter-feeding aquatic organisms that had filtered 
the bay in the past. So now we have a sick bay and a chicken industry. Or here's another example. Uh, mangroves, uh, an incredibly effective storm protection system, uh, also a uh, place that serves as the nur nursery for many uh, aquatic animals. Mangroves are being rapidly displaced by tourist development and in particular by shrimp farms. So what if you did an economic analysis of the benefits that communities get from shrimp farms as opposed to existing mangroves? The timber and non-timber product value of mangroves is $800 or so per year per hectare. And the output of a shrimp farm for a similar area per year is over $8,000 net. So it seems like it's an easy choice. Too bad for the mangroves, hooray for the shrimp farms. That's why shrimp, which was once a delicacy, is now one of the cheap foods available in seven different sizes in every supermarket. Well, if you look at the value of mangroves in terms of their nurse, the fact that they're a nursery for fisheries, you can add a little bit to that value. If you look at the value of the mangroves in terms of coastal protection, although admittedly uh, this is a vague calculation depending on the storm that you expect, suddenly this proportion looks reversed. Incalculable value if a significant storm occurs. And then if you look at the subsidies that go to shrimp farming, suddenly the economic trade-offs look completely different. And then if you look at the pollution that comes from shrimp farms and is destructive to areas around the farms, it looks even like less of a deal. And then if you count in, as you have to, since shrimp farms have a limited life, the cost of restoration of the mangroves, it turns out the shrimp farm has a negative value. The existing mangrove has an enormous net present value, but we don't make the decisions that way because the value to the community of the existing mangrove cannot be monetized. It is only harvested when there's a storm, whereas the value to the individual owner of the shrimp farm is monetized and can be collected reliably and immediately. Interesting trade-off. Here's a, another example of a very conscious uh, trade-off. Um, you probably know the story of the disappearance of the Aral Sea. Um, this is one of the world's great inland seas. The uh, Russians made a decision uh, that uh, the sea was less valuable as a fishery uh, than it was as a source of irrigation water. Uh, the result is the sea has lost 90% of its value, of its volume. Uh, people living along the shores who depend on fishing industries or other values coming directly from the Aral Sea have been forced to leave. Some 40,000 people have been driven out. Uh, 60,000 jobs in canneries and the fishing industry were lost. Salt and pesticide-laden winds now rake across the area and affect crops as much as a thousand kilometers away. There is actually quite a thoughtful effort underway to restore the Aral Sea, uh, to identify alternative crops that don't require so much irrigation, to understand the trade-off of values. There's actually a lesson here, right? Um, it was not that the original engineers who decided to drain the Aral Sea didn't do a comparison. It's just they did it with blinders, fishermen versus farmers. And the farms were productive, important, and the choice looked easy, but it was wrong. Um, so this is an effort to take a new look at an old debate. I said we're here between EPA and AID. Since I started working on environmental issues, I remember running into the debate about whether you could, should sacrifice development for environment, whether environment, in fact, was important to development. Was there a trade-off? How do you make the trade-off? 
I think the evidence of the Millennium Assessment is not that you should choose differently when you choose between ecosystems and development, it's that you can have ecosystems and development or neither. It's both or neither. The relationship is clearest for the rural poor. Rural poor are about 75% of the world's poor, and of course they are people who are dependent entirely on ecosystems for their well-being, for shelter, for food, for jobs. Um, there's one example uh, from Africa of the proportion of the well-being of a rural village that's drawn directly from ecosystems. Um, it's important to recognize here, in addition to the 60-some percent that is directly from crops, livestock, woodlands, and gardens, that almost all of the wages and home industries are also directly dependent on ecosystems. So apart from remittances, ecosystems are the sustenance of this village. This analysis can be duplicated in, in India, uh, in uh, Thailand, and in Latin America in terms of the dependence of the rural poor on ecosystems for their well-being and therefore their vulnerability to d destructive practices. It is generally true for our issues that bad governance leads uh, to poor implementation of environmental policies, but it is especially true for the rural poor. And there is significant evidence that the converse is also true, that good governance, that inclusion uh, and empowerment, participation and tenure lead to examples of significant improvement in ecosystem management. The last edition of the World Resources Report documents about five cases uh, that demonstrate that case. We're in the process of documenting many more. But rather than pursuing the, that anecdotal evidence, I'd like you for a moment to imagine what might be in the future as we think about ecosystem services. Um, first, let's take a, a look at um, the world imagining that it is owned by Earth Products Limited. It's an integrated global conglomerate that provides products and services to customers all over the world and has done so for a long time. It's one of those built-to-last industries. Um, it's only recently that in the wake of certain corporate scandals, uh, the huge capital accounts have been audited uh, by 1,400 leading scientists and the audit reveals a company in deep trouble. Nearly two-thirds of the company's divisions are in fact operating at a significant loss and eating into capital. Only four are profitable. This sobering report points to a lack of internal controls and effective information systems, inefficient transfer and pricing mechanisms, distorted values for Earth Products Limited um, and its output. The governance of this company, our planet, is based on an outdated system set up when nature seemed essentially unlimited, but is now producing results that are running accounts toward bankruptcy. And we don't really grasp the fact yet that it's important. Now imagine another alternative. Take timber services. We have harvested timber simply as a commodity. But we could imagine a set of services uh, and compensation systems that were very different. Uh, money from eco-tours and eco-hunting, uh, carbon sequestration, biodiversity credits, watershed protection payments like New York, flood protection credits like Panama, non-timber forest products. You can imagine a system that goes out of its way to compensate the forest ecosystems for all of the services it provides and that more than offsets the loss of timber sales, which are a one-time benefit. That's the, 
the fantasy, that's the picture, the vision on which the recommendations in restoring nature's capital are based. Let me just quickly run through a few. Information is the most important. Akim emphasized that we don't yet fully understand our connection to, inf inf to uh, ecosystems. We need to make information more widely available. This is, after all, the information age. It's astonishing what we can provide and should be able to provide uh, in real time and usable form to people. And green is hot now. This is a teachable moment. When we talk about nature this time around, now that the public's once again paying attention, we should get beyond charismatic megafauna and talk about the value of ecosystems to human survival. Um, we should build on the examples that have worked extremely well, the connection of some consumers to sustainably harvested wood uh, built on by companies like IKEA, which is using satellite maps that WRI produces to harvest wood even in Russia uh, that is deemed sustainable. I talked about the importance of participation and empowerment, rights and access. We can build networks, we can use communication in order to empower people to affect decisions that exploit the resources on which they rely. We can do that, in fact, in preference to major infrastructure investments. It seems probable that the most successful development decisions will be those that enhance rights. We need to develop mechanisms for regional collaboration. Um, the report suggests the creation of ecosystem service districts, biome stewardship councils, and the Commission on Macroeconomics and Ecosystem Services for Poverty Reduction, a global commission trying to raise the level of understanding among finance ministers and economists of this set of issues. I agree with Akim. This is not something that can't be done by macroeconomics. It just isn't being done. We need mechanisms of transparency and accountability. Uh, we need norms for decision that help people to understand what the crucial information is they need. Think of yourself as the decision maker in a community who is trying to decide whether still another shrimp farm development uh, should go forward. You couldn't even get good information to make that decision, even if you knew that it would help you and that there was some question. Until we create information tools and norms, decision makers can't be held accountable for making better decisions. I would note that uh, there's also the question of corporate accountability, uh, which may be able to move more quickly. We're doing work now with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development to develop an ecosystem footprint measurement device that will enable companies to calculate and report their ecosystem impact. The King II report in South Africa suggested that the Joburg Stock Exchange begin requiring reporting of ecosystem impact uh, as part of full accounting disclosure. Going on from that concept, uh, many of us have had begun to have success convincing capital markets and uh, major investors that climate risk is in fact a valid issue for investors, uh, both from the risk side and the opportunity side. Uh, major pension funds are now demanding that uh, companies provide them with full risk analyses and strategic positioning on climate. Uh, WRI has done a series of reports with big investment banks designed for their customers exploring climate risk and opportunity. We need to extend that concept to ecosystems. Just as relevant, just as compelling a set of issues, just not matured in the same way that climate has matured. We have the carbon markets in place. We need to go on to ecosystem services. Finally, we need to address the issues of subsidies, which distort uh, even the commodity markets and fail to convey effective messages about the costs of the exploitation of ecosystem services. Uh, we are working on the tools for the private sector that I mentioned on a set of economic analysis tools 
to enable uh, government decision makers uh, to make uh, more effective decisions. Uh, we are open to partnerships for exploring other parts of this uh, policy, uh, these sets of policy recommendations. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And ask Akim and Francis and Janet to join us up here. Uh, as I mentioned, we are broadcasting this program live on the Internet, so I'll ask when you pose your question to let us know who you are and use one of the microphones that we have. We can ad um, address the panel itself or certainly feel free to designate your question for one individual. So who would like to uh, kick us off? I think Tom should ask a question. <laughs> well, we'll put, yeah, we'll put Tom on the, on the spot here in a minute. We'll give him a second. Gentleman in the back. Yes, thank you. Um, Rich Blausen. I'm with both uh, Defenders of Wildlife and Green Track Strategies. I have a question for um, Akeem Steiner. You mentioned biodiversity at the G8 summit, and I wonder if you could um, comment on the link of the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity to brokering the MA globally and, um, and what opportunities for synergies um, in all the continents, perhaps. Terrific. And, and Aki, maybe we can even broaden that to environmental issues at G8 with the, with the Germans hosting. There's, I think, real prospect for these issues to make some move forward. Do you want me to respond? Sure, now? sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think what, what is interesting is that we, and to use this slightly overused phrase, at the beginning of the 21st century, something is beginning to happen that I think we have been waiting for a long time, and that is that environment is beginning to shape the mainstream decisions that we are taking economically, politically, and geopolitically also. And it is interesting when you look at the debate about climate change right now, there are those who, you know, conduct it under the auspices of a technology agenda, efficiency. Others under a kind of national security agenda, which is essentially energy security. The interesting thing is that whether you come from this corner or that corner, climate change has offered, in a sense, through an environmental lens of what's happening to our planet, a quantum leap in terms of decisions that otherwise would not have happened. The reason why I see that as important is that I think we, we are entering, you know, the 21st century or the 20th century was an extractive century of development of our economy. It was an extractive one in the sense that we, we learned how to use what the wealth, and beginning with the Industrial Revolution, but the scaling up of it uh, really occurred in the 20th century. I think the 21st century becomes one of actually discovering the economic and technological opportunities to, even to take the title of this publication, reinvest in the productivity of, of our planet. The reason why I also believe the G8 has taken up these issues is that they have become an, really an issue of economic security. Never mind the, you know, the, the debate now, is it a geopolitical issue or not? Environmental change is ultimately now a defining variable in looking at the futures of our economies, nations, um, trade flows, etc. And just to give you an illustration of that, I live in Kenya. That's where the headquarters of the United Nations Environment Program is. We now have a major controversy breaking out between UK consumers where supermarkets have taken the initiative of putting a little sticker on whenever a product is flown in by an aeroplane because, you know, UK consumers want to, in a sense, switch their consumption and not create more CO2 emissions. This is, in theory, the death nail to a major sector of Kenya's economy, which is the flower trade, because Kenya supplies, I think, well over 50% of the imported flower produce in Europe. It's a major agricultural sector activity. It's a classic example of how environment is now, on the one hand, making consumer behavior shift in Europe, on the other hand, is threatening a development sector and opportunity of a developing country. It's given rise to a fascinating debate about, you know, what is the actual CO2 footprint of a Kenyan rose on the shelf in, in London or Manchester as opposed to a Dutch rose. And so the science is now chasing, in a sense, the market signals to try and establish consumer behavior criteria comes also to some of the discussions in here about stewardship councils and, you know, the whole certification business. The Biodiversity Convention has lingered to some extent in the last, you know, since Rio, 
in a situation where it defined, I think, a very progressive framework for addressing the issue of biodiversity, for which society really wasn't ready. I mean, if you remember the three pillars of the convention, were in fact very much broadening it out from the purely protective agenda to, secondly, the sustainable use agenda, and thirdly also, the access and benefit sharing agenda. And what we are beginning to see now, and that's why I think it has re-emerged also in the G8 context, is that that third pillar in particular, but also the second one, which are really the economic dimensions of managing biodiversity rather than the scientific natural ones, are in fact beginning to hurt, but also to offer new opportunities. And that is why I also believe that we shouldn't be surprised if under the umbrella of the Biodiversity Convention we will see the access and benefit sharing agenda, I think, gain momentum in international discussions in the near future. And that convergence is what you see, you know, in a sense, as a symptomatic reflection in biodiversity having re-emerged on the G8 uh, calendar. Thank you. Dick Smith. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dick Smith, State Department. I, don't, I want to ask about the role of international negotiations and agreements in addressing these problems. Uh, back when I was involved in the 80s and early 90s, uh, when the Cold War ended and uh, arms agreements were falling off, there was a feeling that the new uh, world would, would be one of, in which the world community was most interested in environmental agreements, and many very important ones were negotiated at that time. The, the uh, Montreal Protocol on substances deplete the ozone layer, the acid rain agreement with Canada, the drift net agreement with Japan, many others. And I and others felt at that time that we were in the, in the business of creating a nexus of international law and practice in which cooperation would become the norm. I think, well, I know I am, and I think most people are kind of disappointed with the way that's been going lately. And I wonder whether now that you are getting more recognition of these problems and more response to them nationally, uh, there shouldn't be a, a push to try to get these agreements going again so that we can put in place sort of the international cooperative nexus that we, uh, we really need, and then wouldn't that be useful? Um, uh, I certainly share your sense of frustration. Um, it, it, for many years, the principal times when I saw Akim were when we met at the meetings of one convention or scientific body or another. Um, it was a group of a couple of hundred people who showed up at these international meetings, and it seemed like uh, we were all kind of on the same circuit and began to seem as if the international conventions were more devices for delaying action than uh, for causing action. That said, we can't really address these issues unilaterally. They do require in international collaboration and understanding. Uh, I'm, I wonder whether we will not see a period of effective action uh, that is regional or, or bilateral uh, rather than international before we see a full-scale return. Um, you'll notice that some of the mechanisms proposed in, in this report uh, focus around ad hoc systems for collaboration rather than creation of new conventions. I don't know if my colleagues yeah. have. I think this would be a good opportunity if you want to uh, uh, expand on that point where you see the specific recommendations from the report plugging into some, uh, the existing mechanisms, but also some of these innovative ones you've suggested to go forward. Right. You go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, one of our recommendations is the importance of working across different levels. And uh, this is political levels, geographical levels, ecosystem levels. And really the way the international agreements uh, come into the report is mainly through linking them to work at the local level or at the broad regional level, the uh, biome level perhaps, and that this would be done informally through uh, networking initially. So for instance, the ecosystem service districts that uh, Jonathan mentioned, uh, getting the information actually collected at the local level uh, so that people can make decisions there, but then that clearly needs to be connected to what's going on in the Biodiversity uh, Convention or other conventions. 
I'd just sort of add that one of the challenges that we're up against in managing ecosystems is that we typically tend to fragment their management into specific services um, and create these silos, silos, even though ecosystems are very much interconnected. So the challenge is how to create new forms of institution that can manage them as a collective piece. And so a lot of our recommendations on new forms of institution try to address that particular challenge. Why don't we come down to Tom Lovejoy in the front and then we'll work our way back. So first of all, I'd just like to uh, congratulate you on that presentation uh, because it is so, f so much better at making the case than almost anything that came out of the, the big complicated uh, assessment report. Uh, but my question is looking forward, uh, and I think probably both Akim and Jonathan, you have thoughts about this. Uh, what are your thoughts about institutionalizing the process of the assessment uh, off into the future uh, so that it becomes, you know, something that's a regular set of indicators that tends to move policy? Um, not surprisingly, uh, Akim and I discussed this last evening. <laughs> uh, I don't think there is any other possible way to do this than to ask UNEP to take the leadership. Um, the world has a long tradition of asking UNEP to do things and then not giving UNEP any money to do it, so they can't do it well. That would be a significant uh, mistake here. The initial proposal for the Millennium Assessment uh, grew up outside of the official United Nations system. The funding was raised outside of the governmental system. Uh, much of it came from the GEF and from the Packard Foundation. Um, the leadership was a very interesting hybrid between um, representatives of the Convention on Biodiversity, the FAO, the other UN agencies, and representatives of the NGO and <coughs> private sector. I think it was probably the most multilateral UN process I've, I've seen and in, in multi-sectoral uh, in that sense. I would love to see UNEP under Akim's leadership play a role in assuring that the science supply side continues to produce what we need. No, I think th this is a discussion that is, is very urgent now because we are in a sense still in, in the follow-up phase of, of the MA. I think uh, what you just alluded to, I mean, we too, when we were in the final stages of it, and I think Walt would agree with it, to me, the seventh or whatever chapter was never written, which was the economics chapter, in a sense, of the MA, because it, it you know, ran out of time to take that knowledge that it had generated on ecosystems and turning it into the kind of, um, I think, actionable uh, messages that are there. I, in, in UNEP, we are, in fact, um, reconfiguring a whole division now around ecosystem management. Uh, it's going to be one of the divisions alongside the, the Division for Technology, Industry, Environment that is looking more at the whole, let's say, brown technology, chemicals, um, manufacturing, built-up environment agenda. The other division is going to focus on ecosystem management, um, specifically going one level beyond the individual biomes or species issues, but really looking at how can we help governments take the notion of ecosystems as a management framework, as a series of um, both knowledge inputs, but also capacity building inputs when it comes to setting economic incentives to linking up different sectors with one another that we want to invest quite a significant amount of time in that. Because I think in many, many countries now, as competition for resources, degradation and pressures on resources become more intense, understanding how systems interface, how they can help each other, communities upstream, downstream, or corporate user downstream with local resource host upstream, in inverted commas, these relationships hold a major key to trying to create both the economic opportunities but also the management opportunities. In the discussions over the last few months, I have been asking many of my, my colleagues and friends in the community, is UNEP the right place, in a sense, as an anchor institution for the Millennium Assessment? Because it grew out of a partnership that was really outside the UN and then hooked onto the UN because it was a governmental bridge, if you, if you want. I think right now I, I would argue that probably if we want to make this 
a reference point for governments to seriously work with the evidence that the science will generate, the policy, let's say, um, opportunities that this analysis will provide, then having it anchored in a UN body, and then obviously I would argue it, it could very well be the United Nations Environment Programme, makes a lot of sense to me. And we are certainly ready, and this is a discussion that we will have over the next few months with some of the key, let's say, godfathers, godmothers, and patrons of the MA, to see whether we can construct a formula where, and I use the term anchor deliberately, because I think the success story of any global assessment today is, is to avoid making an institutionalized product, uh, because then you, you're essentially operating on an exclusive basis rather than an inclusive basis. Now, I would like to see the success of the MA maintained in terms of being a, an, an enabling and a convening framework but it does need to have an institution that ultimately has a host commitment and a host responsibility and a host mandate. I think the three go together, and that's a construct that we're working on right now. Um, just the last point, the, the discussion is also, do we need an IPCC on biodiversity? As you know, there is a discussion in, on a conference that happened in Paris two years ago, setting up a panel. There are many different initiatives. I think we also have to learn some of the lessons from the IPCC, but also understand how biodiversity is different from the climate challenge. And I think uh, we should not fall too easily into the trap of saying we just need another IPCC on biodiversity and we'll see the same thing happen. First of all, we haven't got 20 years' time <laughs> to, to wait. And secondly, I'm not convinced that the nature of the problem around biodiversity in terms of knowledge is the same as we had on climate change. Uh, so these are a few aspects that we are looking at. But I certainly envisage, and there is a growing number of governments that have also expressed an interest in the EMA as a platform to continue. Terrific. Thank you, Hakim. We have quite a few questions now. We'll start with Voice of America, and then we'll pick up, I think, three or four, and then let the panel respond to make sure everyone has a chance to answer their question. Yes, yeah, please. I'm Roseanne Skirbel with the Voice of America. My question is, um, if you could sum up the recommendations in the report and also put them into context. Are there models out there that we should be looking at um, that are doing things correctly or according to your recommendations? Okay. Terrific. Sean, if you could just come down to Karen right there. and We'll pick up a couple of these. Yes, yeah, gentlemen there. Please. Go ahead. We're going to gather three or four. Yeah, go ahead. Whatever you prefer. Oh. Uh, I'm Karen Klubnikin, and I was recently with the Forest Service, and I have left. Yay. Um, last year, as one, of, as one of the last projects I did, I, because the United States has a lot of good data, it was a good place to look at ecosystems, private land ownership, and what the patterns are. And so we went through uh, working with the GIS tech taking out chunks out of um, ecosystems that don't exist, in which are areas uh, possible for perhaps restoration, since this is sort of in part restoring nature's, nature's capital. I think a lot of us have been wondering about this. And I use the World Wildlife Fund's uh, North American volume, which is a few years old now, but it's the best we've got. And the, and the result was not pretty. I mean, the, the uh, extent and the contiguity of ecosystems in the United States is really in pretty bad shape. And we have, we have you know, layers of governance that could address this. And people like Gretchen Daly and, and uh, Jeffrey Heal have already been thinking about things like districts and all that kind of stuff. But, but they're not organized necessarily to the natural boundaries in the natural world. And then you've got private property. Um, really a major sticking point, point in all of this. And there has to be incentives for private owners to want to plant native plants and to have the seeds, to have the, the direction. And so we're talking about a huge, you know, we've got the Department of Agriculture has this huge infrastructure for seeds and all that kind of stuff, but it's not necessarily ecological in nature and it's not oriented towards natural restoration. And I'm just wondering how we could get there using some of these big mega networks that are already in place, but it means a learning curve in terms of changing back to native plants and native this and native that. I mean, they don't have that mentality over there, and yet they're the big gorilla in town. Okay. If we could pass it to the gentleman here and then the lady here, and then we'll do another side on that. Yes, please. 
I am uh, Uriel Safriel, and I am one of the lead authors of the Dryland Systems and the Desertification Convention of the MA. And um, I happen also to be the focal point of uh, the State of Israel for uh, the CCD. Um, you mentioned several times uh, both the terms uh, ecosystems and biodiversity. And uh, my uh, experience with um, many decision makers, policy makers, and also the general public is that they are somewhat confused now about the difference between these two entities or terms. And um, they don't know quite what do we mean by each of them and why we distinguish between them. And this is a question to all members of the panel. What would you tell them? Okay, terrific. A framing question. We'll have one more right down here, and then we'll start, Karen. We'll start with the gentleman in the front row in the next round. Pat Fibbs, I'm a reporter with BNA's Daily Environment Report. I'm wondering how can you achieve your goal of valuing ecosystems when U.S. companies, at least, have to report profits four times a year and when the U.S. government has a tendency to sign international agreements but never ratify them? Not to put too fine a point on it. Who would, who would like to uh, kick off a discussion on that batch of questions? I, I'd suggest Janet take the one on Terrific. summarizing the recommendations. Yeah, I, I'd like to, to take a shot at that. Um, I think the, the, mo the most significant thing that I would like people to take away from this report is that we're about advocating a new way of thinking about ecosystems from the development point of view. We're not talking about protecting ecosystems from development here. We're talking about investing in maintaining ecosystems and their services for development and restoring them. Um, and at the, at the 2000 UN World Summit, uh, the, the Costa Rican Environment Minister got up and said, he says, what, what environmentalists need to do is they need to learn the language of economists if they want their agenda to be taken seriously. Now, the concept of ecosystem services, the benefits that nature provides to people, and therefore, by definition, is all about development, is that language. It's a way of making that translation. And the five action agenda items that we have outlined here, which is information, incentives, accountability, managing across levels, um, and, and, and rights. Those are the five ways that we can start to mesh ecosystem services into the way we make decisions about development. Um, and so, you know, that's the sort of wiring that needs to happen. You want to add to that, Fran? Yeah, we, we, we have, um, the, the, the book is filled with lots of sort of very interesting examples. Um, that actually, f for the most part, exhibit um, you know two, three, four, or more of those five action items. They, they have to happen in, you know simultaneously. It's no good having information if you don't have rights over resources, and if you have information but you don't have any incentives. So you have to kind of line these five things up. So we, we we give lots of examples, but the challenge going forward is to take these one-off examples and to sort of start scaling them up. We can connect with you afterwards and give you some case studies yep. if that's what you want. Yeah. Terrific. Although I think that the New York City wetlands one is a, is one that certainly resonates in this country. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. We've got um, examples from um, from India. You know where we 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 have a a group there that's working on watershed restoration linked to sustainable rural livelihoods, and that's an example of where communities work together to sort of invest in the restoration of of their watersheds, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the results have been startling, you know, four to five times increase in income related to some of the rural, rural benefits there. And some, that is starting to get taken to scale. We've got, you know, more than a thousand villages where we've done the, set, where the same restoration has happened. Um, but, but still, much more needs to be done. Just picking up on the very cogent points about the, the Forest Service and the U.S. situation, it, it is a, a wonderful statement of why it's important for us to focus on the Ag Bill. Um, it is a major opportunity to begin to get these concepts into legislation, and if we don't, it, it, it's an uphill fight to, to try to change what's happening on the ground. Um, do you want to talk about the biodiversity and ecosystems issue? Not that it's of my making, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in part, <clears throat> the way I would answer it in simple terms would be to say that biodiversity focuses on the science of, of the diversity of life, trying to capture all the species and, and how they depend on each other on this planet. The emergence of the term ecosystems is linking that 
vitality of life, that totality of life, to the kind of human interface that we have and how we uh, can understand how ecosystems function as a whole, how they interact with one another, how communities upstream, downstream are connected by ecosystems. It's the linkage from the science, in a sense, into the productive and the societal. And so it's, one can argue over that in many terms, but that's how I would explain the, the emergence of that term. And I, uh, when I was Director General of IUCN, quite frankly, welcomed that, because I think society needs to not necessarily understand biodiversity as such, just like we don't need to know how you build an engine, you need to know how to drive a car or how to uh, cycle on a bicycle. You don't need to know how the chain necessarily works unless it falls off and you're on your own somewhere in the forest. But, um, so I think that that analogy also holds between biodiversity and ecosystems. It is taking a broader view of how what the totality of life on the planet is and how it matters to us and how what we do to it matters in terms of many ramifications or levels of, of consequence. Um, perhaps just a comment on, on how do we expand, if you want, the spol policy space. I'm both, I think, Karen, you said it and you referred to it in terms of U.S. policy. I think it is trying to um, also, and it goes back to a comment right at the beginning on international no agreements and, and, and laws. I think we have learned a lesson also, and at the same, it's a very natural progression. Let us not underestimate how much we actually manage to do. We have over 500, some people say, in our transboundary agreements. In less than 25 years, we have moved from a planet that had virtually no institutional home for many environmental issues, or they were somewhere you know, in the Ministry of Agriculture or Ministry of Transport, um, to having virtually in every country an institution, a legislative framework, uh, the linkage between, in a sense, the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary, because you can go to courts now. We've established a whole legal precedent and a, lo a whole legal framework in, in less than a quarter of a century, on top of which we have managed to bring together for the first time in the history of this planet 192 nations in these global conventions. And yes, we all get frustrated by some of the inward focus. I mean, the CBD now has 1,400 pages of decisions. It's in part a reflection of despair. Nobody's listening to us, so let's talk to each other and see how we can <laughs> cut up the issue you know, into its last quartile and, and spend our time figuring out what, what we're going to do about it. But all of this at the end of the day, I think, has created a foundation on which we now have to rethink. And I think I have one of the decisions I've taken in UNIP is to refocus our division on environmental law and conventions on actually, uh, particularly the environmental law area. And uh, from the basic assumption that I think we will now see a second generation of environmental law development that will not have the shotgun approach, but I think will be a much more targeted set of uh, legislative tools that are developed. Now, in the United States, inevitably, you are already a long way down that path, I mean, whether it's the Endangered Species Act or it's the kind of easements legislation that you can use, and which is one way to create policy space for you know, ecosystem restoration through private land ownership. There are many, many legal tools you have developed. I think different societies, different economies at different stages of development have to find their own mix, but we will certainly see more happening here. That's the one thing at the local level. And it also replaces a little bit that advocacy approach of environmental law development of the last 20 years, which is in a sense top-down. We're now looking, and this is part of also what's in here, how do you bring the management of natural resources closest to those who actually have the power to manage them or the power to destroy them? And law has often started very much from a bird's eye perspective and not necessarily from the local dynamics of managing resources. The other major agenda will be coherence and synergies. We have unleashed on the world a, a, a highly complex, opportunistic and often not thought through system of environmental agreements that is you know, confusing our own community. It's making many countries struggle to participate in it in terms of reporting obligations. I think it is high time and this is partly something that I think has to come out of the U.S. also, because at the moment we do have, to some extent, very ambivalent signals. The U.S. would like to have more efficiency, more productivity in terms of the agreements we have. On the other hand, it would like to keep them very much in distinct arenas and not necessarily to look at how can they be connected more effectively. And that is a discussion to which there is no simple answer, but it's a discussion that I think is highly urgent if we are not going to come to a point where this environmental law uh, body begins to implode or simply becomes redundant. 
Jenna, I want did to pick up. Oh, oh sorry. No, no, I just no. want to briefly respond to the question about well, how do you get businesses to value ecosystem services when they're just focused on profit? Well, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. You have to actually show how ecosystem services relates to the profit, the bottom and top line. And one of the ways that we, we, WRI is working with with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and the Meridian Institute to actually try and to road test a methodology that actually helps companies assess their risk and dependence on ecosystem services, because companies do use ecosystem services and they also impact them. But actually systematically understanding what that dependence and use is does actually help them identify risks and opportunities that do relate to the profit. And I think that's a, a very effective way to engage them around this issue. Okay. Uh, let's start another round of questions. The gentleman here, there's a microphone coming to you here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rob Walcott, and I'm with the uh, Office of Research and Development at EPA. And uh, we at EPA have decided to uh, invest 200 people and an entire ecological research program uh, in the very framework that uh, the WRI team has laid out here. And uh, I would also note largely as a result of how WRI has laid this out over the course of the last eight to nine years in their birthing. Uh, we uh, have chosen to emphasize what they have emphasized here, which is the action side of the agenda. How do we induce actors, landowners, firms, communities to actually recognize the value and then invest? And my question to whomever uh, chooses uh, to answer here is how do we take what is an effective budget for conservation uh, and ecological service uh, conservation to a two-order two of magnitude increase over what it is now because it really is that finance side. I'd almost say it's the finance above the economics that's going to enable us to respond. Uh, and what I mean is the economists and social scientists can debate the subtleties of how we value for 30 years, but what it's going to take is hundreds of billions of dollars expended by firms and governments to actually make the affirmative investments. Okay. Yeah, I should introduce the person who just spoke. He, um, when I started working on environmental issues 30-some years ago, he was the first person I ever met who... Uh, called himself an environmental economist. <laughs> um, he's been laboring in these vineyards uh, for many, many decades. Uh, Rob, thanks. Uh, did you want us to wait well, for a response? Why don't we take a couple more? Okay. It's obviously a, a very important question. We go to uh, Major Shannon Beebe. Hi, thank you both for your presentation. Uh, my name is Shannon Beebe. I'm with the Department of Defense. Uh, as you're probably aware, we've just announced the stand up of an Africa command, so my question is specifically to that. Uh, as we've gone out to do our strategic communications and outreach to a lot of the African community, the ambassadors, uh, a lot of the feedback we've been getting on this command as it's supposed to be a non-kinetic uh, type of dynamic command is what are you going to do about environment? What are you going to do about some of the, some of the issues that are facing us, particularly uh, Mozambique and some of those areas down there? Uh, my question to you is, is how do you see uh, the Africa Command partnering uh, with your organizations, and what do you see the role of Africa Command being in the environmental security, the, uh, the ecosystem uh, uh, security and sustainability? I uh, would be very, very interested in, in talking with you and, and finding out information about that. Thank you. Terrific, Jan. There are other, yes, the gentleman right behind there. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Jameson, uh, lead author of the International Coral Reef Initiative State of the Reefs Report and uh, president of Coral Seas, Inc. Um, I'd like to ask a question regarding action agenda item number four, uh, improving transparency and accountability for decisions. Uh, could you give me some specific examples of how you're going to accomplish that uh, agenda item, say, for the United States? Okay. Is there one more? It's hard for me to see in the back. Yeah, let's take one more. Hi. Thanks. My name is Luis Pavon. I work for the Nature Conservancy. Um, I would like to ask you if there are any risks, potential risks of uh, producing biofuels and how that will be approached. Right. 
We'll have to have a couple more meetings on that topic. That's a big one. Uh, but why don't we give our panelists a chance to respond to these because we're coming to the end of our session. So, Jonathan? I'll respond uh, at least partly to Rob's question. Uh, when uh, KKR went to Goldman Sachs and said we'd like you to finance the largest LBO in history when we buy uh, Texas utilities, and Goldman Sachs said, uh, not unless you green the deal. Um, well, was that environmental economics? Sure, uh, it was environmental economics in action. Um, they were doing that because they'd reached the point of understanding that there were real risks associated with climate, the fact that TXU had made themselves the poster children of bad uh, climate decisions uh, made them a target because the pension funds who would invest in the deal uh, wouldn't invest if it, if it wasn't green. I, I ultimately think this connects back to the earlier question about uh, valuation. If customers and shareholders begin to ask questions and uh, talk about the services that they expect people to demand in 10 years, that will drive the process. Um, the, Africa Command question, do you want to? Um, I'll, I'll just skip to the other question, but maybe we come back to that. The question of um, what can be done in the United States to um, promote accountability uh, in relation to these issues. I think uh, having um, a, a regular ongoing monitoring and reporting system for the state and condition of the U.S. ecosystem services uh, would be a key sort of piece to underpin any accountability of both the public and private sector in relation to those services. So I'd, I'd like to, to see that happens. What gets measured does get managed and accounted for ultimately. Um, I'd, I see no reason why ecosystem services, which are benefits um, to the people and, and you know, should be treated any differently from, from eco you know, economic indicators. So um, I, would, I would like to sort of support that piece. Um, one, one other possibility um, that's actually being focused on in the UK now is the, the, the discussion about the UK Treasury Department as part of its public expenditure reviews will actually look at um, the, the impact of public expenditures on ecosystems. So it's so another example of being accountable. Um, and, and certainly how the farm bills um, payments, um, you know, how do they actually support or, or undermine ecosystem services? Um, on, on the Africa piece, so just, I'd like to have that conversation with you afterwards. I, I see a lot of opportunities, so let's, let's talk. The, the, the MA reports are rich in information specifically relevant to Africa and particularly to that dry zone um, in Africa, and uh, there's a lot of material to develop there. Just a <clears throat> couple of comments on this question of the order of magnitude of the quantum leap mm -hmm. on finance. I just want to reinforce what, what Jonathan was saying. I have been intrigued in just the last few months watching how the climate change reality has changed the marketplace. I mean, this is, I think, one of the, the most fascinating things that you can observe right now in the interface between environment and economics and the marketplace. And I think it has a lot to do with how does a company anticipate a future consumer uh, profile to be responsive to certain products. It touches also on the issue of biofuels. I mean, right now, I think many, many potential investors and in companies would like to enter that sector, but they're trying to figure out what is a condition for that sector to become more predictable, because if all we are, in a sense, investing into is another conflict uh, like GMOs or nuclear energy and so on, which creates enormous risks in predicting what the market, by the time you come on stream, is looking like, drives now the investors to actually ask for having sustainability criteria agreed. I mean, one of the fascinating things at the beginning of the 21st century is that the multilateral approach to dealing with some of these issues is coming back at the request of the market, which is a major turnaround from where we were even 10 years ago when companies largely said, keep regulators out, let the market fi figure it out. And whether you take Nicola Stern's you know, sort of approach of calling climate change the greatest market failure, or you take the more pragmatic view of corporations today that say, look, these are issues, we are global players, we have global markets, therefore we need to find some form of norms and standards development which ultimately requires you know, another entity outside my company's reach, brings them very much back to, and that's why UNIP I think has had in the field of collaboration with companies and what WRI is doing now with the World Business Council, we see a much more intelligent discussion between regulatory 
helps in the sense stability enabling markets to actually grow and hopefully grow more sustainably um, so the consumer is going to be I think the factor X on on the order of magnitude uh, and you mentioned Goldman Sachs I mean Goldman Sachs is also now investing in a 300 million dollar investment in Colombia on a major ecosystem restoration and forestry uh, project purely on private uh, sector market returns and here we start seeing, and I think this is an important part of what, what is going to hopefully happen in the next few years, that the financial markets, the banks, become part of the multiplier capacity in leveraging these kinds of resources because there is no way that public funding will ever reach a level in transfer payments that is even going to come close to the kind of resource mobilization we need. And I just want to mention to you a small example in, in India, which we just released last week. Everybody says solar technology is really beyond the reach of the poor. We had an interesting project in, in the south of India and parts of India where we essentially with two commercial banks bought down their interests by 2% from 5 to 3, I think it was, and got them to extend their loan cycle from 3 to 5. I haven't got the exact numbers in my mind now. To enable villages, village households, to purchase on loan solar technology to replace the use of kerosene. Within three years, this project has gone fully commercial. We no longer provide the buy-down on the interest rate. Four banks are now involved. 100,000 households are actually replacing kerosene, have replaced already kerosene, with solar technology. This supposedly impossible, economically not viable, uh, anti-poor renewable energy stumbling block simply remove with a small market stepping stone initiative. I think this is where we have to get you know, people to realize that they're being sold very often uh, a mythology also of the economic impossibility. And the, the, the sooner the consumer, the sooner the market begins to believe that, the quicker people in the marketplace will develop the products to actually scale up. So without being a naive idealist about the benevolence of the marketplace, I think a regulated marketplace can create tremendous incentives for that kind of initiative. Just a brief comment on Africa. I think you, you raise a very interesting point. Um, obviously, there is an element of uh, you know, m military presence that will always be a complicating factor, but that is one, one channel of you know, who is with whom and what interests. But I think we're, we have seen some very interesting discussions in recent years is how the ability of the military establishment, one, to deploy latest information technology can provide decision makers in countries which often don't even have the basic technological infrastructure the latest information on their tables for decision making. Let me just put that in relation. Africa right now cannot even monitor properly the impact of climate change on the continent because it has less than one-eighth of the recommended uh, infrastructure of meteorological monitoring stations that the WMO recommends, less than one-eighth. So parts of Africa cannot even look at what climate change might mean. You know, an establishment like the Africa Command, the US, the US Army, has enormous possibilities to mobilize information. The second thing is how to set the issue of environmental change and geopolitics into a context with one another, whether you call it security or, or whatever the terminology might be. The changes occurring on the African continent right now, resulting from degradation, from increased uh, land use, moving into marginal zones, uh, transboundary river basins, all these are things that you can today put into a context and allow decision makers in Africa, like the African Union, to look at the information like you do, I think you call it national security assessment or there is a particular uh, tool that you use in the United States also. I think on that level the Africa Command could make a tremendous contribution in the sense of information and analysis uh, that you provide as part of the infrastructure you already have and the information you have at your disposal. And then using the presence of, of you know, the U.S. on the continent also. Um, and that I'd be interested to give you a couple of examples that I can think of right now. But I think it is in information analysis because, you know, we've just had a, an airliner of Kenya Airways crash. It took more than 24 hours to find the aircraft. I mean, this is, you know, in the modern age of being able to zoom in with a satellite on the last house. How can this be possible? That's the reality in Africa today, in parts of it at least. 
Terrific. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there because of time, but there's obviously uh, a tremendous resource that we now have with this report, and we're very grateful to the World Resources Institute for doing it. We're very thankful for being able to, to host them as well as Akim Steiner and UNEP here today. And on behalf of WRI, UNEP, and the Wilson Center, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I urge you to pick up a, a copy of the, of the report out front, to s send people to the Wilson Center um, website to see the video of this uh, program and stay in touch on these issues and uh, welcome you back in the future. So please join me in thanking our panelists.